Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin while others come in. Let's all stand up. We had a big day here yesterday, so I know some of us are kind of tired. But we're going to be revived in the presence of God. Amen. So let's just give ourselves to worship and uh, allow God just to flow through us and minister. Father, we just come to you this morning. We are so grateful for who you are and your great love for us. And we just want to worship you this morning and honor you and bless you. God, thank you for your goodness in our life every day. Thank you, God, that we can depend upon you. And as we gather today, Lord, I just know you have plans for us. You have something you want us to receive from you. But we want you to receive from us first this morning. And we want to give you our worship. And so I just thank you that as we worship you, that you're just going, uh, you'll be blessed, but because you are such a giving God, you're going to minister back to us today. And so we open up our hearts to receive from you. We're going to worship you with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And if you're in agreement, we say... Yeah. 
Shake the mountains, break the walls. 
Worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Jesus.
No one but you, Jesus. No one but you, Jesus. Shine through the shadows, burn the 
hearts changing, minds changing lives. Father God, I thank you this morning for your presence. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your understanding. Father God, I ask for more of your grace, Father God. I thank you, Jesus, for it to flow in abundance and in great bounds in my life. And I thank you, Father God, for the church of BFF, Father God, where you speak life, where you speak wholeness, where you speak healing. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. And as we say your name, Father God, that the chains break off, Father God, I thank you that when we speak your name, healing happens. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, for your touch on every single person in this room, every single person watching online, Father God. I thank you that as we receive from you, we are going to pour out more of you. As we receive, we pour out more. And I just ask for more of you, Father God. More, more, more. And so, Father God, as we sing, shout Jesus. thank you right now for your presence in our midst and I pray Holy Spirit you sweep through this place right now touching those physically mentally emotionally that need a healing Lord we just submit our souls to you right now 
We need that rest. You know your soul realm is your mind realm. People need peace, don't they? So I speak the peace of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. May it rest upon each and every one from the top of your whole head to the sole of your feet, the soles of your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your healing power. Lord, bless those that are away this week, that are traveling on vacation. Refresh them, strengthen them in Jesus' precious name. And Lord, as we were singing about the miracles, Lord, we thank you for the miracles that you've wrought. Just in our congregation this year, we're, we're just in awe of you, Lord God. And we thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' precious name, we seal this time off with your precious blood. Let it be a sweet-smelling savor unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. It's been a busy week this week for a lot of us, but a good week. So uh, some of us are a little tired physically, but it's a good tired, right? I know Andrew and Ann, they've been busy all week long doing camp meeting up in uh, their, their campground where they have their cottage and all. And Andrew had the privilege this year of... Um, heading up the ministries, bringing them in. And we had a lovely time Thursday evening. The, uh, some of the worship team was able to go up with us. And it was just precious people up there. And uh, we worshiped in a building that was, uh, I think he told me, was about 1900. It was, it was a gorgeous old building and uh, had pews in it. And uh, it was just a fun evening. So I know they're tired because they've been doing uh, like a, a, tent, a revival meeting every evening. And so yesterday, I'm going to let Miss Anna come and Krista, these two gals, let's just stand up and give them an ovation. Come on, standing ovation. I'm so blessed by you two. They did good. They did good. Jesus. And Krista, I'm so sorry. Yesterday was her birthday. I forgot to no, wish you happy birthday. Tomorrow. Oh, oh, then Facebook had it wrong. Yay, tomorrow is her birthday. Because I was feeling like terrible that I didn't even wish you that. Well, I'm going to let them talk because it was a blessing. Come here. You want to go? Ah. <laughs> okay. You get, to, so, you get to see the thanks. Okay. Yeah. First, I want to, we want to say thanks to everyone. And I actually want to start last Sunday with the things yes. because it was amazing. The manpower moving everything into the sanctuary from the cafe, and it was like, emptied out yep. all the rooms which we needed and I mean I thank everyone who helped yes. for that and we then couldn't do it without you. no we couldn't lift no. all that stuff it was heavy stuff <laughs> so and then the same yesterday I'm telling you it was like whirlwind you know the yeah. people and, and and when everyone was done and I, I was standing there right. and I said it looks like nothing happened yeah yeah now everything was back in the place and, and thank you for that. Yeah. And also, you know, for even for the event itself, you know, the people, and I, I hope I don't forget anyone. I mean, I want to start with Miss Kitty, Karen Davis. I mean, these two ladies rocking it from seven o'clock in the morning till, oh. you know, then... Um, Ethan and Jess. E oh God, Ethan and Jess. I mean, spending hours setting up this place. Um, what you see in here right now, if you didn't get to be here yesterday, every one of our screens had snow, had um, winter scenes going, and we had music going all day long, yes. all because they were here to do that for us. Yes. And, and the vendors were just like blown away, yeah. Yeah. just blown yeah, away. We, we got, I mean, so many, yes. so many compliments, compliments that at yes. what, everybody did it. Krista and I maybe had the vision, and this is something God's been, yeah putting on us for a long time, things happen, but God put it together now, and I want to make sure he gets all the glory, because I, I am, Chris and I both were blown away yesterday. I cried my way home yesterday, yes. because yes. God brought over 300 people yes. through that door yesterday. Yes. 300, over 300 people. We, 
came through that door yesterday, yes. and every single one of them that we heard from said they felt peace here. That's right. They were they were felt welcomed here. We had one vendor said, "I'm coming to your church." Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was like that kind of a yes. feeling, and it was it was God. Yes. People were in the parking lot waiting to come in. We did yes. we said we weren't open until ten. They were in the parking lot at nine thirty waiting yes. to come in. Yes. Wow. Yes. And the atmosphere in this place. Mm -hmm. People responded to that very much. They said, this is so uh, 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 friendly. This is so uplifting. And we were, that was our thing, peace, mm -hmm. as they come in. And vendors and, and guests, they were talking with each other. Yeah. There was so much yeah. communication and interactioning happening. And that, that blessed me, yeah. you know? I'm sorry, I'm, why am I crying? That blessed me yes, so it, much, it you yeah. know? Like oh, the man that said, we want to come to your fall craft show. And I said, I didn't know we have one, <laughs> you know? So, but again, back to the help. Every, anyone really, seriously, thank you for, for really helping that. Yes. Uh, we, we needed, you, you know, the, the manpower, and that was very special too, yes. to see that. I mean, like coming together, doing all these things, that was. Precious. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No, don't leave. Don't leave. I want y'all just to stretch your hands towards them and let's just pray God refreshes them this week. Lord, I just ask for my sisters. I pray a special blessing upon them. Refresh them. Restore the hours and the time they've put into this, Lord. And I just thank you that you continue to give them creative ideas. But Lord, they don't have to outdo this year. They're just going to walk in the fullness of the joy that you give them and you lead them and you guide them. And we thank you that it was an awesome outreach to our community and we didn't have to go anywhere we were just right here thank you jesus amen, amen. thank you everyone amen not that we won't go out at times but this was an awesome awesome time so pastor while we're testifying i just have a testimony as well um you know that um i've been dealing with uh reoccurring prostate cancer since uh 2019 and uh, so last summer, uh, during this time, really, I was doing radiation treatments. And uh, when I went into the radiation, I had a 1.2 PSA. And um, after radiation, it was 0.8. I went in January, it was 0.39. I went in April, and it was 0.19. I went this past week, and it's 0 0.07. <laughs> Almost zero. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, I was testifying yesterday that God had been doing some miracles here, and we give him all the glory. I was able to pray for one of the vendors because she was late getting here. Her back was hurting her. I said, would you mind if I prayed for you? And she said, well, no. And so I prayed for her, laid hands on her, and just encouraged her. And so they, they, I know they felt the atmosphere of the Lord, and that's what we were going for, right? Plus, I've heard from some of you, you've made some, some good cash. So thank you, Jesus. Now, since you made good cash, remember, we're going to receive the offering. <laughs> Always a pastor. <laughs> Amen. I mean, it was, it was just a blessing yesterday. Pastor Mike and I had a good time. I had my John Wayne hot dog out there for 13 bucks. Woo! It was... It was, well, I forget what some of the other names were, but that one was pretty good. Okay, let's receive our tithes and offerings this morning. You waving at me? <laughs> Donuts. George is waving at me. I told him to wave at me. We have some uh, a big, big boxes of donuts left over from yesterday. If you can take those and it will bless your household, please do so so they don't go to waste. I happen to know you can freeze those because uh, you can put them in baggies and you can freeze them and then when you get the urge to have one with your coffee, you just run out, get them out. They fall real fast, especially if you dunk them in coffee. I can't do that anymore, but some of y'all can. But please see George or Anna after church because uh, we don't want those to go to waste and I don't want Mises in the, in the church. Okay? 
All right, our scripture, Romans 4, 20 and 21, says his faith did not leave him, and he did not doubt God's promise. His faith filled him with power, and he gave praise to God. He was absolutely sure that God would be able to do what he had promised. Are you absolutely sure God can do what he promised? Amen. If you're not, go back over your life and look at all the times God came through for you. Sometimes, you know, he told the children of Israel to put, him in, put themselves in remembrance of him, of the great deeds he had done. And Mike and I have served the Lord for, since we were kids. We can look back over just our life and see where he never forsook us. He's always right there. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. Amen? So God is so good. Our confession, Lord, today I fix my attention on the promises you have made to watch over my life, my home, my property, my business, my children, my decisions, and my finances. I trust in your wisdom and your power, and I know that you are mindful of my whole world. Today I take a part of my life and give it to you as a praise and a thank offering. So, Lord, we just seal this time off with your precious blood. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to give once again into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The plates are in the back, or you can, if you're listening to us, uh, you can send it in, you know, th through the website. And so we will see that it does good works. Um, Children, you can be dismissed now. Have a good time. And it's my privilege this morning to welcome Ann and Andrew Taylor. Gosh, we were talking the other night. We've been friends about 30, I'm thinking 30 years. Um, and they just have, you know, been a blessing in our life. He and his son Luke and his first wife Patsy, we came to know them. Patsy went home to be with the Lord and God sent him Anne, and when God does things, he does them so good. And she just has complimented him, and then the, their ministries combined, and so we love having them here. I always tell you they are good ground to sow seed in. And they did something this week I just heard about the other night. Now, can I just testify just a minute about you? Just, I just want to brag on you a little. I love their ministry. Because he keeps it above board, he does his books properly. I'm, uh, I sit on his board, and Mike usually takes me up, so he's allowed him graciously to sit in, and and it's just a it's just a fun afternoon we have of just fellowshipping. And he does their ministry with excellence. He always has, and I appreciate that so much. Integrity speaks so loudly nowadays, doesn't it? So this week, I want to show you what true ministry is. Both of them told me he asked for prayer for one of his students who had, uh, she's actually in her 50s now, and he taught at the um, Bible School or the Living Word Academy for how many, when did you start? Six or seven years. And you had to be pretty young because you said your student is now in her 50s. But she's developed, is it ALS? She's dealing with. And that's, that's a very tough disease. So he had put it out on his, if you're uh, partners with him in APT or you're on his Facebook page um, or, or he does excellent teachings, it just I would encourage you to be a part of that ministry. He asked for prayer for this young woman. But what blessed me is both he and Ann have committed while they're over here in the States this summer to give her one day a week and go and minister to her and just be there with her because she's to that point, she needs someone to be with her. That's a servant's heart, folks. They're, uh, they're just as tired as anybody else. They work just as hard, and he, like I say, he does his ministry with excellence. He still keeps time for playing pickleball. I don't know what Ann does for fun, but he's a pickleball person. And, but I appreciate so much that servant's heart because that speaks servant. And if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you learn to be a servant to all. You never outgrow that. You don't stand in the pulpit to become great in God's kingdom. You just serve. 
where you need to be served. And I know it's blessing this young woman because I was telling Ann, for someone like Andrew to do that, he took such good care of Patsy. He and Luke just treated her like a queen. You, you, and it was, she was just a beautiful woman and she was in a lot of pain a lot of times and she carried that so well but the way they ministered to her was such a blessing. That's why, Ann, you never have to worry about anything. That's a good man. But I know you're a good woman, too. But I just wanted to share that because not every person would do that on their time off in the States. And every Sunday, they're out ministering somewhere. And sometimes they have to drive the distance. So I bless you, brother and sister. I bless you. Come on up. And I want to thank you for being such good people of integrity. Okay, I think we got it. Uh, well, we'll, just before Anne starts, thank you, Pastor Mike and Debbie, for having us. We're honored. Just want to mention that since you mentioned about our teachings, so if you haven't, I'd be honored if you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you search on either Google or YouTube, as you can see there, for the at Andrew N. Taylor. Not A-T, it's the at symbol, and N stands for no nonsense. I think you know that. At Andrew N. Taylor, and subscribe, we'd be honored. Every Sunday, we have a little uptick in our number of subscribers. Um, I know some of you have subscribed, but if you haven't, you never heard about it till now, please do. Uh, the world out there doesn't want the word to go out, or the truth of the word. They will propagate everything else. So. Uh, just to give you a little idea, I was eating uh, pistachio nuts at a friend's house not long back, and while I'm eating them, opening them and eating them, the Holy Spirit gave me an idea. Because some are, you know, easy to open and eat, shell, and the others a little more difficult, and some are so closed, you need a nutcracker, they need a specialist. And some, the nuts wide, the, the, the shell's wide open, the nuts not at home. So... <laughs> Just from that, I felt the Holy Spirit give me an idea. What type of nut am I? I didn't say, are you? Am I? So that's one of our recent uploads, just from real day-to-day -day life. So if you subscribe, we'd be honored. Now we could go to the PowerPoint there. Uh, George, is it? Or Teresa, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, a App Foundation's tax exempt with its own 501c3 status. It's a mission and teaching ministry. Next. Um, I will let Anne share a bit while we, I'll just give you the signal for the moving of the slides. Go ahead, babe. Well, um, thank you for the privilege of being here again. And I, I'm so grateful uh, for, for Victoria's Faith Fellowship, who supports what we do in India. And everything that God has done through that ministry, you are a part of. And I, and I just give God all the glory for that. Um, the update would be that uh, this was a very special year because we were back to normal in the sense that, uh, you know, we got all the children coming and uh, it's been just a, a, a very precious year so far this year. And um, for Vacation Bible School this summer, we ha actually had all our children who were part of Door of Hope at one time. And I was able to see the ripple effect of what the seeds that we sowed in their little lives when they were with us, when they were two and a half and three, they're actually part of Sunday schools or some Bible group uh, within their communities at the age of 10 and 11 and 12. And that is, you know, all glory to God to see that happen. And um, any more? Uh, whatever you want to share. Yeah. And I thank you. You are a part of that, and God bless you for that. Amen. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the, the $10 a month was for the little ones at her project. The $15, $12.50 is for those who demonstrate a scholastic aptitude. We sponsor them to English schools, which covers their tuition, uniform, and books. And next, uh, that's the second floor is Anne's. Door of Hope floor. You see, the, if you, I'm not sure if you can read the sign. We've called the building Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there. So you don't have to run after the money. Just seek his presence and everything else will follow. Yeah. Yeah. He's our Jehovah Jireh too, but I want his presence. Moses said, if you don't go with us, we're not moving from here. Uh, next slide. 
uh, will go to App Foundation and touch on Door of Hope, which is her passion and her project for, you know that she has a passion for the poor, the homeless, and the underprivileged. That's why she married me. Okay, so. <laughs> Anna's laughing too hard at that, is it? <laughs> you want some more about that? She's actually, a, she's actually an engineer, an architect by profession. She gave that up to serve poor children, so that's fact. Yeah. But the biggest mistake she made in marrying me was she thought she'd redesign me. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this is one of our alumni from in Indonesia, a Bible college in Indonesia, the biggest Muslim country in the world, Torkas. has got a church of over 2,000 people. Next, two girls who are our alumni who serve over 200 homeless people on the streets of Jakarta. Next, uh, our student body in Indonesia. Next, our graduation in Indonesia. Next, uh, by, the way, by the way, Pastors Mike and Debbie have been to Indonesia and Fiji. Both of those countries administered our project. So uh, this is our main building, in, uh, campus building in the Fiji Islands. Next. Uh, student body in Fiji. Next. Uh, little children at our little Christian school in Fiji. Next. Uh, a new building that we had completed in 2020. And everything, like your church, has been paid for. So we praise God for that. Next. Uh, this is two acres. We have seven acres on one side, two acres on the other. It's been raised up to 100 year flood proof levels. Next. And this is our international size rugby field with staff quarters in the background. Next. And uh, when we're in Australia, I've been privileged to have some open doors for ministry and churches in Adelaide, where Anne used to live and where we now live. Adelaide, Melbourne, where I have some family and Brisbane, where I used to live, or my late wife and I, and uh, I have a bunch of friends there, and I ministered there for 10 years. So those are the places. So when I'm in Australia, I mean, we don't run into kangaroos every day like, like you don't uh, run into deer. But maybe you see a little more deer here. But the kangaroos are kind of gray and you know fluffy and not that big. They're up a tree, so you have to really catch them. One day, I remember a, a neighbor in our cul-de-sac she was out there on a Saturday. She said, oh, Andrew, come here, come here, come see this. There's a koala up my gum tree. Gum is eucalyptus tree, so. And she was all excited, and so were we. It's like, it's, you don't often see it in a housing development. Um, and that's all they eat. You know, eucalyptus is actually like, a, it's like a, it's kind of, it has a drug-inducing effect. That's probably why they're moving slow-mo all the time. Okay. <laughs> Next. Uh, my first two books are sold out. The third one, there's some copies as you exit. It's ten dollars each. It has five of the seminars, five of the twelve seminars we've taught. It's ten dollars a copy or twenty-five or three. Next, here's the ways you can be involved in. And already VFF is a significant part of us. Not only are you a faithful monthly partner, your pastor, Pastor Mike invites us, has invited us for so many years. Pastor Debbie's on our ministry board. So they literally know all the books of the ministry. There's nothing hidden here. So uh, praise God for that. Uh, next. Oh, would you subscribe to our YouTube channel? There you go. That's another reminder. You can connect with us on, on, on Facebook. Next. Uh, oh, oh, should I? Yeah. Uh, is this being live streamed? Yeah, so we have another project with another country, but the title tells you a bit. Next. Uh, yeah, thank you, and the Lord bless you. This morning, we'd like to minister on, it's a special, shall I say treat, a special shout out to the ladies. But it totally applies to the men also. Every woman that walks with God has a story to tell. Every woman that walks with God has a story to tell. The glory is preceded by a story. The glory is preceded by a real life story. If you talk to Sarah, we just read a scripture that was talking about Abraham, the father of faith. If you talk to Sarah, his wife, I mean he was 100 and she was 90 when Isaac was born. But when she first heard the news, you know what she did? She laughed. So if you ask Sarah, who was totally postmenopausal, <laughs> I'm just, and I'll read you the scripture. That I didn't, what do you say about God, Sarah, from your life story? She'll tell you 
nothing is too hard for God. Amen. Nothing is too hard for God. Here's Genesis 18, 11, and 12. This is what the Bible says, and I read. The way of women, that's your monthly cycle, had ceased to be with Sarah. So she laughed to herself, saying, after I'm wore out, I mean, I'm old now. Uh, and my husband, he's old. Shall I have pleasure? There's no chance we can have a child now. And she laughed. And so, of course, God always has the last, not only the last word, the last laugh. So she has a son, a biological son from her husband Abraham, and she's to call his name Isaac, which means laughter. So for the rest of her life, all of her living days, she's got to call him laughter because she laughs, so God has the last laugh on her. But Sarah will tell you, nothing is too hard for God. As the young lady testifying there about her friend being clinically dead, nothing is too hard for God. If you talk to Hagar, she will tell you that out even in the wilderness, despondent, literally thrown out, she will tell you, God is still there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We know the story. Sarah initially, after laughing, she says to Abraham, you might as well go and try having a child through the younger handmaidens, uh, handmaiden Hagar. There is no hope of having a child with me. And uh, obviously there, were there are ongoing repercussions for that action, uh, carnal action initiated by her. Abraham follows. You know, he just listened to her. Here's the words from one of my pastor friends in Australia. He said, concerning the Lord and my wife, where he leads me, I will follow. What she feeds me, I will swallow. So, but he just followed his wife's instruction instead of being obedient to what the angel of the Lord told him. He goes into Hagar. She's pregnant with Ishmael. And suddenly, Sarah, who made the initial suggestion, becomes jealous and says, chase that woman out. I don't want her here. And so she's chased out. And in the wilderness, desolate, Pregnant and despondent, the angel of the Lord speaks to her and tells her to go back, gives her instructions. In Genesis 16, 13, we read, And she called the name of the Lord, that's a title of God, who spoke to her, Thou God seest me. El Roi, R O I, not Rohi, Roi. El Roi, God. You see me. You see my plight. You see my condition. I am totally down and out desolate. But you see my circumstances. And some of us here might be able to relate to that. And it doesn't just have to be a lady. It could be a man too. She will tell you God is still there. You are never alone. Never bereft of his presence or forsaken. If you talk to Hannah... She will tell you from her life experience, my God answers prayer. My God is a prayer answering God. We read in the books of Samuel, she was not drunk as Eli the high priest supposed, but her fervor for God was such. Her husband, Elkanah, had another wife, Peninnah, who had children. And the Bible says Peninnah made fun or, or probably snide comments at her because she was barren and could not have children. And so she cried out to God. And once a year, they would go to Jerusalem, to the temple, to offer sacrifice. And so she goes into the temple. And she was so earnest, but yet so desperate. The Bible says her lips moved. Well, let me read it for you. 1 Samuel 1. 13, 14, and then 17. Verse 13. Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Let me pause for a parenthetical thought here. In a certain religion around the world, they have the whole PA system active from their place of worship, and five times a day they call people to prayer. It's a highly audible reminder to go and pray. 
But you know, when I was uh, some years back, we had a chorus: "God's not dead, no, He is alive." I'd like a tick off for people like that. God's not deaf, no. Our God is not deaf. Right. We have another beautiful chorus we used to sing: "He's as close." as the mention of his name. He hears the faintest whisper of your heart. Yeah. Sometimes it may not even be a whisper. He sees the tears that roll down your cheeks. Only God knows our thoughts. Not Satan, so don't panic there. But God knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. It says only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk, and he said to her, how long will you be drunk? Stop drinking this alcohol. Put your wine away. And then she tells him, no, my Lord, I'm not drunk as you think. I desire a child, and if God gives me a man-child, I will give him back to God. Verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition which you have asked of him. And she gives birth to a son named Samuel, who becomes one of the most outstanding, impeccable prophets in the history of the nation of Israel. As a tender child, God calls him by name. And he was not only a prophet, he also became judge over Israel. So Hannah was a woman of unflinching, persistent, prevailing prayer. You ask Hannah about God, she'll tell you, my God answers prayer. Dr. Ruth, she will tell you, it's not over till God says it's over. Yep. It's not over till God says it's over. Naomi with her husband Elimelech and their two sons Malin and Kilian leave Jerusalem and Israel because there was famine in the land and they go to the neighboring country of Moab. Remember that, Moab, outside of Israel. And when they get to Moab, the two boys marry Moabitess girls, Orpha and Ruth. And Naomi has a trip tragedy in case you think that you, you know there's an old beautiful Negro spiritual the first line goes this way nobody knows the trouble I see and that's a beautiful we understand the tremendous oppression and suffering they went through but Naomi had a triple tragedy yeah. in case you think oh I lost a loved one I've had this diagnosis I've had this her husband Elimelech dies, Marlon dies, Killian dies. She is left in a strange land with her two foreign Moabitess daughters-in-law. And then she hears that the famine is over in Israel. And so she makes a determination. She has nothing else to live for in Moab now. Famine is over. Let's go back to my house and little piece of land. And so the two girls start coming with her. And then she says, go back, girls. It's too late for me to have sons to bring you future husbands. And Orpha goes back. But Ruth makes a choice. And she says to Naomi, more by just that she was, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. She adopted Israel. Ready or not, here I come. You know, we think of being adopted. She adopted, and they embraced her. Listen closely. So Ruth comes with Naomi, and the house is obviously in a dilapidated condition. There's no man about the house anymore. The little land they have, the ground is fallow. And so God, through Moses, had given instructions to all of Israel, those who had fields when they grow grain, to leave some when you harvest. Don't clean the whole thing. Pick it, don't pick it clean. Leave some for the poor to come and garner. So Ruth goes out 
probably with a little satchel, a cloth satchel, to go and pick barley from the field. And lo and behold, who should spot her? A well-to-do man, the owner of that field, named Boaz. And he asks his workers, who is that lady? His eyes are light on her. Long story short, Boaz marries Ruth. If you, if you ask Ruth, she will tell you it's not over till God says it's over. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Verse 14, then the woman, women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord. Ruth's son by Boaz, his name is Obed. So Ruth has a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David. King David, from whose lineage comes Messiah, Jesus Christ. Blind Bartimaeus calls Jesus son of David. So Ruth, the Moabitess, becomes the direct great grandmother of King David of Israel. That's God at work. It's not over till God says it's open. By the way, she was Moabitess. She wasn't even Jewish by blood. In case we think we are so pure. I mean, literally, you could be pure white or pure black. I'm a hybrid. Notice I didn't say half caste. And in case you missed it, you learn in genetics that hybrids are disease resist resistant and produce better fruit. <laughs> Haven't you had seedless watermelon this summer? You know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not feeling sorry for you. You can just rejoice for me. Okay. <laughs> we call it cross-pollination in botany. Right? Actually, you guys are a classic example right there. Jeff and Chris, that's uh, right there. You, uh, okay, so cross-pollination. <laughs> yes, yes. And that, that, that lends to a tougher breed. So Ruth will tell you it's not over till she becomes the Moabitess lady who had brought her, who adopted the people of Israel and they embraced her, becomes a direct great grandmother of King David from whose line Messiah comes. Now watch one. How do you top that? Are you ready for it? What's the next lady? Ask Rahab. When we say Rahab, there's two other words that follow it. What are they? The prostitute. Old Testament says the harlot, same thing. Ask, what, how does this stop this? Just follow me. Ask Rahab the harlot, she will tell you that God can use anything and anyone at any time to fulfill his plans and purposes. Now, Israel sends two spies to Jericho. So this last one was Moab, this is Jericho. Both non-Israelite or what we'd call, uh, the Israelites would call pagan countries. So these two spies go to Jericho. And the men of Jericho discover, learn that there's two Israelite spies. By the way, guess where they went when they went to Jericho? They went to the red light area. <laughs> and that's Rahab's house. And her house is on the city wall. So there's a window basically, you know, able to escape out from the outside of the city walls. But they go to the red light area. The Jer men of Jericho find out. They come to Rahab's house. And here's what the Bible says. Joshua 2 6 and then I'll jump to 18 when the men of Jericho came searching for them to Rahab's house she took them up these two spies of Israel to the roof and hid them or covered them with stalks of flax, flax which she was probably drying out on the roof of her house which she had laid in order on the roof of our house in Jericho and because of that their lives were spared they escaped with their lives and then the men of Jericho leave. They then thank her for saving their lives and tell her these words. We read this in Joshua 2, 18. When we come, Israel is going to come and attack Jericho. But for the favor you've done to us and for helping spare our lives, follow our instructions. When we come to Jericho, you bind and hang this line of scarlet cord or rope through which you're letting us down. 
to our safety and escape outside the city walls. You hang this line of scarlet cord on the window through which you let us down and make sure you bring your father, your mother, you bring your whole household. Everyone who's in your household will be saved if, we, if Israel sees the red cord. Just like reminiscent of the 10th plague in Israel where God told the, the families, the Jewish families, slay a male lamb without blemish and then sprinkle the blood on the two doorposts and lintel and when the angel of death passes at midnight, he will pass over you. When we see that red cord, we will pass over your house. You and whoever is in this house, their lives will be spared. So what, how does this stop Ruth? Keep following me. She and her family are spared. Now, you think we're done with her in the Bible? Not so. One of the chapters that very quickly puts Bible readers to sleep is Matthew chapter 1. Because it's a whole list of genealogy. Adam begat Seth, and Seth begat Enos, and Enos begat Mahalil. <laughs> Won't believe it. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, hear what we read. Matthew 1, 5. Now, uh, by the way, we eat, I, I eat fresh fish. And one of them is salmon, right? But how do you spell salmon? S-A-L-M-O-N. The L is silent. But in Jewish genealogic, genealogical names, there's a male name, S-A-L-M-O-N, but the L is not silent. It's Salmon. So I'm not mispronouncing it. You with me? For a male name in Israel. Matthew 1.5. And Salmon became the father of Boaz... By Rahab, we're not done with her. Salmon and Rahab, she too came into Israel, right? So she now hooks up with a guy named Salmon. They have a son named Boaz. So Rahab, known as the harlot or prostitute, leaves that country, leaves that life, comes and and joins the people of God, meets a man named Salmon. They have a son named Rahab, has a son named Boaz, who marries Ruth, who has a son named Obed, who has a son named Jesse, who has a son named David. Rahab becomes the great, great grandmother of King David, king of Israel, after whom Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is named. Phenomenal. She will tell you, if I may be allowed to use this phrase, Rahab, that God can take someone from the guttermost to the uttermost. If you talk to Esther, she will tell you that God can turn a nobody into a somebody. That God can turn a nobody into a somebody. Esther was an orphan. Now we need to turn to a Jewish writing called the Midrash. It's an extra biblical writing, but they read, and Jews pretty sharp, pretty smart, they research the parts of scripture that are silent. Now how do we, we know about Mordecai. This confusion. Some people think he was an uncle. Some people think he was a cousin. He was a quite a bit older cousin to Esther. For these details, you need to go to the Midrash. Now listen closely. From the Midrash, we understand, we learn that Esther's father died while her mom was carrying her, while her mom was pregnant. So she never ever set eyes on her earthly father. And that her mother died ensuing childbirth. So she's basically born an orphan. So talking about a nobody, just in case you want to sing that same refrain, nobody knows how, you know, how difficult your circumstances may have been. Esther was born an orphan. And her father was Mordecai's uncle. So he's an older cousin. All of us have, you know, some cousins who are quite a bit older or younger than us. You know what I'm talking about. So that's the scenario. 
And God uses Mordecai, her older cousin, to become her guardian. She becomes a ward of Mordecai. Now we continue. Her, her life was kind of like a Cinderella story, except that she wasn't mistreated as Cinderella was, but the hardship of starting out as an orphan. And then uh, we talk about beauty patterns, especially in these United States, you know, Miss Maryland, uh, Miss USA, Miss Universe, hello, the world simply copycats what the Bible has laid out for us already. The world's first beauty pageant is found in the book of Esther in the Old Testament, where he receives counsel from his uh, personnel saying, you know, when he was looking to get married again, this had issues with the other wife. They said, find from all the fairest maidens in your kingdom. By the way, Esther did not become queen of a country. She became queen of an empire. The Persian Empire, the greatest empire in the world at that time. So she wasn't the first lady of one little country. Right. She was the first lady of the empire that ruled the then known world. So they have the beauty pageant, and here's what the Bible says. We from Esther 2:17. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen. And then there was an evil Agagite, King Agag, his descendants, Agagite. The same man who Saul was going to spare, but Elijah hewed in pieces. Elijah hewed. His descendants, Haman was an Agagite. He wanted to destroy all the Jewish people. And Mordecai, sitting in sackcloth and ashes at the gate, sends Esther a message in the palace. Don't think that you will escape just because you are in the palace. And she undertakes a three days fasting and prayer with her maidens in waiting because you can't approach the emperor, the king's presence, uh, uninvited, your life would be forfeit unless he extended his royal scepter to you. And so she says, I will fast with my maidens for three days and nights, and I will present myself to the king. Which means she was willing to take her life in her hands, and in her own words she says, if I perish... I perish. But Esther was willing, and this applies to men too, this attitude. She was willing to stand in the gap for her people. She was willing to put her life on the line, literally. And you can imagine on day three, she's completely bedecked from head to toe, comes uninvited in the king's presence, and he is just zapped. Instantly, the scepter goes on. What is it, Queen Esther? Ask of me to the half of my kingdom. And she just invites him to a royal banquet. But the job gets done as a result. The point I want to make is God used Esther as a, we only think of the term deliverer with reference to Moses, as a deliverer of the people of Israel. He used a lady to do Come on. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I told you this is a shout out to the ladies, but it applies to us men too. Just slipping over to two New Testament examples. If you talk to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, she will tell you, you can carry. Sister, you might feel I have not accomplished much in life at all. Nobody even knows who I am. I have just two and a half friends on Facebook or Instagram or <laughs> TikTok or whatever. You ask Elizabeth, she will tell you that you can carry and give birth to greatness. What if you don't have children? God can put a vision in your heart and you can carry and give birth to greatness. Yeah. If you think about it, I've never shared this before, it never came out like this. Anne has no biological children, but she's got to have, God gave her a vision for Door of Hope. Amen. And so many children from the slums are being educated and nurtured and taught about Jesus. Who knows what they are going to accomplish tomorrow? You can carry and give birth to greatness. Don't demean yourself in your mind and heart, and then don't let the enemy do it to you, sister or brother. 
And who did she give birth to? Luke 141, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, when Mary came to visit her. Elizabeth was about six months pregnant already with John the Baptist. Mary is just pregnant. They are both cousins, which means John the Baptist and Jesus are second cousins. So they would hung around and played a lot, you know, like cousins do. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary coming into the house, the babe, that is John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we read in the Bible that John the Baptist leaped. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. I only got saved at 17. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost about two years later. John couldn't wait to, to pass through the birth canal. <laughs> He was baptized in the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. Incredible. And then in Matthew 11, 11, the Lord Jesus says, Among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And if you talk to Mary, you must say, Brother Andrew, what's profound about this statement? Let me share it and then touch on it briefly. Mary will tell you, to quote her words, as she said to the angel Gabriel, let it be unto me according to your word. She hearkened, processed, listened, submitted, and obeyed the word of God, which is a little different to Eve. She doubted the word of God. Mary said, on the other hand, let it be to me according to... In those nanoseconds, Mary would have had to process. I can lose my fiancé, Joseph. I can be thrown out of the house by my parents. I can be completely trashed by the community. I will be bad-mouthed by the synagogue. Let it be unto me according yes. to your word. You now we used to sing that old chorus before. Apply it here to Mary's case. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, not my way, not my will, but thy will be done. Let it be unto me according to your word. Luke 1, 28, 30 and 38. The angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And no wonder she gets afraid. Anyone who sees an apparition of an angel, uh, it'll unnerve you to say the least. In verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And then in verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I'm sure by that point she was undone. Didn't know what to say, do, or think. But at least she said, Whatever God wants, Amen. I submit to. I don't understand. She's just a teenage, older teenager. I may not understand the whole thing. And surely she could not have known the plan of God. But I'm willing to go with God, to be obedient to his will. And no wonder why she is called blessed among women. Total submission to the will of God. Before we close, I'd like to touch on one more lady who had a profound influence in my life. And that's my late mother. So my late dad was the president of the Bombay Dockyard Labor Union. He was a mafia don type of guy for that kind of job. It was like the third biggest seaport in the world. I think it was Amsterdam, Singapore, Mumbai, Bombay. If he called a strike, not one crate was unloaded from a ship. So you can imagine the power you have. He and my mom, both with Jesus now, they had nine children. Seven boys in a row. One girl, poor thing, feel sorry for her. And one more boy. So seven plus one is eight boys and one girl, nine. It just so happens, and I'm not going deep into numerology, that I happen to be the seventh son in succession. Or and then came the daughter. So I, I kiddingly tell people, I guess I was my parents' last disappointment. They were desperately trying for a girl. Oh no, not a boy. 
I was my mother's seventh son. I didn't realize this, but an Irish Catholic nun from whom one of my older brothers adopted a child from her hospital's maternity ward, she had met the whole family, and I was in my motorcycle days, and I was the only one whom she hadn't met in person and vice versa. But I've heard of Mother Virginia, and she's heard of Andrew as one of the boys. And she heard that I was the seventh son. I mean, she did that herself. She went through the list. I came home one day, put my helmet down, and she walks up to the door and says, you must be Andrew. I said, yes, are you Mother Virginia? She said, yes. You are the seventh son in succession to open the womb. In Ireland, you cannot get any luckier than that. <laughs> She's trying to pull the luck out of me. I tell people, I don't know about luck, but I can testify to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Amen. Nevertheless, that stuck with me, okay? You just happen to be the seventh son in a row. Before I was born, the first three sons, my dad's this mafia don, raised Roman Catholic. He said I was a religious Roman Catholic. I was a nonstop chain smoker, and I had my whiskey neat. Big money, position, and power, a mansion with six maids. I never experienced that, sorry to tell you. I wasn't yet born. Coming home one day on the street corner, he hears a street preacher. And for the first time he hears about salvation through faith in Jesus, my dad gets radically born again. From that moment, the Holy Spirit said to him, I want you to quit your job and preach the gospel. Now listen closely. Quitting that job is not an easy deal. Money, power, position, the whole works. He refused. He said, if I quit my job, who will feed my wife and three sons? Now I wasn't yet born, but wait, I'll get born along the way. <laughs> And he refused to quit his job. He got very, very ill. And my mom used to be a nurse, so he got chronic bronchial asthma, and then with double pneumonia. He was down on his deathbed to 97 pounds in weight, his beard and mustache grown, and he now started spitting up blood. My mom, being a nurse, knew. She sent for the doctor. They could pay for house visits. It came with, this was a perk. The doctor came, checked my, and throughout this time, the Holy Spirit saying to my dad, will you quit your job and preach the gospel? No, if I do that, who'll feed my wife and three sons? Doctor comes, checks out my dad, and before he could leave at the door, he says to my mom, I'm sorry, Mrs. Taylor, I'll give your husband about three days to live. They didn't have Kleenexes in those days, you know. She pulled out her cloth handkerchief, and she's crying as the doctor left. But my dad overheard what the doctor told her. The Holy Spirit said to him again, are you going to quit your job and preach the gospel? What about my wife and three sons who'll feed them? Did you hear what the doctor just told your wife? Yes, I did, Lord. Well, you tell me in three days' time who's going to feed your wife and three sons. You know, some of us men are so bullheaded. <laughs> Seriously, it's so hard headed. And I'm not exempting myself. I'm a chip of the old block. <laughs> then he's, he had no answer. He said, OK, Lord, I'll quit. The moment he made the decision to resign his job, God spoke to a diminutive local minister whom he had met since he got saved who's going home by bus. Those days there were hardly any cars. Now there's a huge economic boom. There's not enough place to park the cars in India. Seriously, literally. So he's going home by bus, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Only after Dad agreed to quit. Get off the bus. Take another bus. Go to Leslie Taylor's house. I want you to lay hands on him. I'm going to raise him up. So hear this as a testimony. He came home, knocks on the door. My mom opens the door with a handkerchief in hand, still crying. Come in, Reverend Paul, your friend is dying. Sister Taylor, I was going home and the Holy Spirit asked me to come and lay hands on Brother Taylor. He laid hands on my late dad. And dad did not just receive a healing, because a healing is gradual. He received an instantaneous miracle in his body. Yes. He was totally whole, but he's still 97 pounds. Right. So give him about a week to 10 days to have some beef broth and get some strength back. But that same day, with a weak hand, he signed his resignation letter. And in about 10 days, he's out on the streets of Bombay. Those days it was called Bombay. Not with just one placard with John 3.16. 
Romans 3, 23, the third and the fourth. He was on a box of four placards with a handheld megaphone, not even battery operated, walking the streets of Bombay, preaching salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And all of his former subordinates thought that L.B. Taylor had gone stark, raving mad. You can't blame them for that. I was born four sons later. So I didn't know that affluence, but I learned all about Jesus. And if you weigh it up, which is more valuable? Uh, so then, while we were, still go back to before I was born, the three boys, they've just, now you got to leave your mansion. There's no big paycheck. Rent a little house. Dad's out preaching, trusting God for honoraria. And one morning, dad's out preaching. Nothing, not a morsel to feed the kids breakfast. And the three boys came tugging on her skirt. Mommy, we're hungry. And she said, well, let's sing the doxology. Some of us might remember. And so mom with the three older boys, praise God from whom all blessings flow. What blessings? There's nothing in the house. <laughs> praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's a knock on the door. And they go to open the door. Hear me now. Mr. Barden is the town Scrooge. Remember God fed Elijah through a raven, brought him meat. The town Scrooge's manservant is at the door. And she says, yes, he says, madam, my master's wife is away for a week out of town. Now, if you're middle-aged, you'll remember in those days, the milkman would come and drop a bottle of milk at your front door. And the baker would drop a loaf of bread at your front door on a daily basis. You had a contract with them. You pay them at the end of the month. So he said, since she's gone for a week, there's a backlog of milk and bread. So my master, the Scrooge, my master said, take it to that preacher's house. Just after they finish singing the doxology with not a morsel of food in the house. If you ask my mom, she will tell you from, and she quoted this to us, Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and am now old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And she had vision for her children. Now I was born. And the older boys had graduated from school in that city. They had now moved to the big smoke of Bangalore, which is the world's IT center. It's got about 10 million people in the one city. It's a nightmare. To, just like it's no better than New York. To get in and out, it's like a nightmare. So she moves there. She wants the next four boys, which is Graham, Stuart, Haddon, Andrew. I'm eight years young. To be admitted into a good private Protestant school. My mom was quite picky, you know. <laughs> so she met with the principal. He was a British uh, Anglican minister, but an educator, Reverend I.L. Thomas. And he asked her at the interview, so what does your husband do? She said, he's an evangelist. So he took a memo from his desk for the office, admit the four Taylor boys. She looked at it and she said, but Reverend Thomas, we wouldn't be able to afford the tuition. So he took the memo back and put their hyphen, full caps, F-R-E-E. -E. I went from grade four to grade 11. Those days there was no 12. 100% free. And I was given pocket money to boot. Something which I never sniffed before that. What a privilege, what a perk. Another favorite chorus of my mother's from Jeremiah 32, 27. She will tell you he's the God of the impossible. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Two more to close. My late mom. I was eight. We had moved to Bangalore. My sister's six. My youngest brother's four. Dad's traveling and preaching. At night, she would tell us bedtime stories, Bible stories. I used to be in shock when I went to the local Sunday school that other kids did not know about David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den. I know all those stories. I may not have had money jingling in my pockets, but I knew about the Word of God. 
So, dad's gone away. After lights out, all the boys sleeping in the big hall. We three, little mattresses on the floor, but we snuggled up, you know. And mom would tell us around her bedside Bible stories. And then one night she came to the crucifixion. And I remember for the first time how it impacted me at the age of eight. In the dark, in her room, three of us, Andrew, Becky, Paul. And I got choked up. I ran to the corner, hid in the corner, and sobbed my way out. Then I came back quietly and I escaped. Nobody knew. The next night I said, Mom, can you tell us about the crucifixion again? And so she proceeded to tell us about the crucifixion. And again I choked up. I ran to the corner. And I was sobbing. But my sister heard me the second night. Mom, Mom, Andrew's crying. She called me, come here, son. She said, why are you crying? I said, Mom, how could they be so cruel to Jesus? Don't ask me how much I could comprehend it, eight, but I, enough. And she said, God has his hand on this boy's life. Mom, sister, brother, a word of prophecy doesn't have to begin with thus saith the Lord. It can. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to have a quaver of the hand or a quiver of the voice. It doesn't have to. All my mom said was God has his hand on this boy's life. She may have forgotten it. I never did. Amen. And then at age 12, the last of the incidences in my known memory. Our dining table for nine kids. Nine children with dad and mom as a soccer team. <laughs> we had literally a ping pong table. We were so poor. We used to put books as the net and play ping pong on the table. You know what I'm talking about if you don't have a net. So we would have nightly devotions. And that night my mom happened to read from the word and pray and sing choruses. That night she happened to read from John chapter 1 where Andrew brings his brother Simon Peter to Jesus at the age of 12 now, with my older brothers around the table. They're working and stuff, some of them. She says, I named this boy Andrew, so that when you grew up, if any of his brothers had not yet received Jesus, that he would bring you to Jesus. Another sure word of prophecy over my life. So, this was a shout out to the ladies but applies to all, I mean, not all, just the two genders, male and female. <laughs> but Pastor Mike, back to you. Thank you. The Lord bless you, VFF. Right. Great work. Great word, Andrew. Great word. There we go. Appreciate uh, your ministry this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sure that most of us can remember maybe something that someone spoke over us when we were younger, some word that we've held on to for, for years that pointed our life in the direction that God had for us. And we appreciate that. And um, so as we close, we want to give you the opportunity to give. Um, you can do this as we close. You can give in the offering to Andrew and the APT ministry and, and all that they're doing and just put it in the offering basket in the back. And, or you can just give online as well and just designate it for um, APT. And uh, God will bless you for that. So Father, we just want to thank you for your word today and how you've encouraged us and challenged us and and, and how you've shown through these examples that Andrew gave, your faithfulness, that you honor your word, and that you take care of us in every situation. And that there is a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And God, we want to we wanna fulfill that plan, and we want to fulfill, fulfill that purpose. And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you're just ministering to each one of us today, that you're revealing to each one of our hearts what you have for us. And we just uh, give you the praise for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for coming and for all those who worked yesterday. Get some rest this afternoon. <laughs>